So this is kind of the basic view of what I'm trying to say with this talk is with hearing aids, um, if somebody's got a deafness, you kind of, you guys presumably all know how a hearing aid works. And if you don't, you should. And um, for those of you just starting off in ENT, you need to know about the different, the frequencies and different consonants and speech. That's quite important to know. Um, so you'll kind of know about that. And, but actually when you think about hearing aids, there's lots of people with hearing loss in the UK. It's estimated, uh, you know, 9 million people with hearing loss in the UK. And a lot of those would benefit from hearing aid. And there's been loads of advances recently in hearing aid technology. You know, they've become smaller, they're better fitting, lots of connectivity, Bluetooth, all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic. But there's still a reluctance to, um, to wear hearing aids. And that's big for a number of reasons, really. There's a sort of inherent stigma associated with them, sadly, which hopefully is changing. But certainly the older generation still still associate it with deaf and dumb. Um, you can get feedback. There's lots of the occlusion effect, lots of things like that. There's also, in addition to that, problems with manual dexterity for some people and pathology, which I'll certainly be touching on in this talk. In other words, the ear pathology sort of precludes you wearing a hearing aid. So they're, they're not perfect for everybody and they often end up in the kitchen drawer, sadly. Um, so that's it. That's sort of what it, hearing aids. But the other old end of the spectrum, if you like, is cochlear implants, as I say, which is one of the things that I do. Um, so we all know about hearing aids, how they work. I don't know if you guys all know about how a cochlear implant works. And uh, if not, then you need to look into it. Although I have to say, having done it for 20 years, been involved in putting in implants for 20 years, I still can't get my head around the brilliance of these scientists who invented these speech programs for turning 12,000 impulses a second in the cochlea and how that stimulates the auditory nerve and it turns into an understandable speech. I think it's just amazing, frankly. Um, but we've got the, we know the principles of that. And you should also know the implant criteria, which was revised in 2019. Certainly you guys doing the exams and things like that need to know this. It's, um, it's basic information. And that's the, that's the graph we show to our referrers about the uh, hearing aid, about the cochlear implant referral thresholds. And obviously there's lots of other assessments that we do once uh, patients are referred. The other thing that sometimes associate with cochlear implants is the idea of electroacoustic stimulation. So that's for, that's the principle behind that is you're using a cochlear implant to stimulate the higher frequencies because bear in mind the basal turn of the cochlea is where the higher frequencies are detected so if we can stimulate the higher frequencies electronically uh, through a cochlear implant then and put the implant in without damaging the residual low frequency hearing then potentially we can use both electric and acoustic stimulation to pick up speech and that's something that's really developed over the last 10 15 years um, I think initially the idea of putting an implant in without destroying residual hearing was kind of like, well, that's not going to happen, but it does happen and it can be done. So the audiogram I showed previously was something like this, but actually I saw, this is an audiogram from a patient I saw last Wednesday in the cochlear implant unit that I just put in um, as an example of something that is really difficult. The left-hand audiogram, it gets tend to refer to as a ski slope deformity whereas this is kind of a, a cliff edge audiogram really and it's extremely difficult this way you've got low frequencies that are pretty much close to normal but then bang high frequencies above 1k they're not hearing anything and they've got very usable hearing they won't find hearing aids useful at all these patients they don't tend to wear hearing aids because they don't benefit from the amplification at the high frequency without distorting the low. And so in my experience of patients with this kind of loss, they don't wear hearing aids, but they've got a lot to lose by having implants. So it's a very difficult decision. Um, but I put that up just as an illustration of the, you know, the, the, it's a difficult audiogram to actually treat. Um, and this talk really is about patients who are somewhere in between those extremes. What, there's a patient, lots of patients who get on very well with hearing aids, find them useful, who have deafness. And then there's patients who are, if you like, bad enough to need cochlear implants or ES. And as a general rule, they do extremely well. But there's a quite a significant body of patients in the middle 
who struggle with conventional hearing aids but are out of criteria for cochlear implantation. So this is kind of, I'm aiming just to do a kind of simple introduction here and um, there's lots, of, there are quite a few different products and I'll mention some but um, I'm not sort of trying to endorse one or the other, I'm giving the principles and I thought to make it a bit um, sort of less boring and a bit more in, interactional I suppose and a bit more interesting, I'm, I'm actually going to show videos of some patients because as I'll mention at the end these patients come to a combined clinic I do with the audiology department and my colleague Chris who you'll see in some of the videos um, so I did these videos that you're going to see in no more than two of those um, last year no more, before lockdown actually no more than two clinics and the patients you're going to see are just sort of standard patients that come through there so the first case is a lady who's got bilateral ear disease and has ended up having bilateral mastoid cavities not that uncommon in actual fact um, so her audiogram is going to be something like this, which is a loss of a moderate loss, but primarily a conductive hearing loss. So here's her story a little bit. Yeah. Younger. Younger. Long time. Ago. Last one I had was 15. You were 15? Yeah. Um, How old are you then? 54. Right, okay. So it was a while back. And you've had mastoid operations on both sides. Yeah. And um, you still get problems with discharge. I do. And off. Yes. So what happens when you wear normal hearing ears? Um, it blocks blocks the air getting into my canal, and obviously, and it must build up the moisture. Yeah. And then I get an then infection. Get yeah. So that's why you don't really tolerate wearing yeah. normal hearing aids. Do you? They even tried to put an air on in the earpiece yeah. to get air in, yeah. and that didn't work yeah. either. And how much do you struggle with your hearing then? I tend to lip read a lot. Yeah. But I'm obviously used to reading body language as well. Yeah. So I can connect sentences together. Yeah. Okay. So, so you kind of worked out a way of managing it. I do. But yeah. it's been a constant problem for you many years. Yes. That's the kind of hearing, that's her hearing loss. And um, as well as a problem with infection, with conventional hearing aid, you need high gain because you've got to cover the conductive loss. Whereas if you use bone conduction, then you don't need to do that. You need little gain in these circumstances. So you're going to get better quality and the bigger other advantage is the fact that the ear canal remains open. So bone conduction hearing aids, not exactly a new technology in many respects. There's been um, devices available for a long time. Um, and in fact, it's a bit trendy. I did, I'm not a massive runner, but I actually did the Leeds Half Marathon yesterday. And um, my daughter said, Dad, you've got to use one of these. They won't allow big headphones over the top, or they don't like that. So why don't you use my bone conducting headphones so and then you can hear the what's going on here the people clapping and cheering and all that kind of stuff and um so i did i thought it was fantastic so it was a it was the first time i've ever sort of used bone conducting um headphones and uh for that kind of scenario absolutely excellent so i'll be recommending to, to patients the other thing is i don't know if you guys have seen this film called the sound of metal a bit it's got its issues in terms of how it portrays certain things with regard to cochlear implantation but it's very good at portraying uh, the disaster that is going deaf, I suppose. Um, but there's a scene in there where he's sitting on a slide, a metal slide with a kid, and he's using the vibrations to pass on, sig to pass on signals. They kind of communicate through it. So bone conduction hearing, device, hearing devices can be, um, there's different types. So the ones that, the, 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 the old fashioned type, if you like, um, traditional type, use, have to send vibrations through the skin to the bone. So that can be fixed on the outside, such as if it's sort of a bone conduction headband, the old old fashioned bone conduction headband, or hearing glasses, like on the picture there. Or there were there are some devices where the they're held on by a magnet that's put implanted into the bone, but the vibrational device, as you can see here, is actually still outside the skin. Skin. So the point is, the sound has to be vibe has to go through skin. The vibration goes through the skin. Um, the cochlear tract is one of them. There's been a few over the years and it's relatively simple, simple operation and can work for some patients. So that's, if you like, a, a passive device that's passing vibrations through the skin. There are other devices that where the vibration is actually directly into the bone. So those, there are two types of that. There's the percutaneous which is on the left here. 
and that's where the the driver if you like of the bone vibration which is screw osseo integrated screw goes through the skin it passes through the skin so that's a classic bone anchored hearing aid that i'm sure you guys if you've been in in ent for um any period of time will have seen patients with a bone anchored hearing aid but there's also other devices now which um do a called transcutaneous so the skin is intact so the vibration is still directly to the bone but the, but the device doesn't go through the skin, it connects through a magnet. So if you talk about percutaneous bone anchored hearing devices, as I say, the, that the, the vibrations are transmitted through an abutment, um, and that also integrates, developed by the Swedish, which actually was originally developed for teeth and dental stuff. Um, and you've, it's fixed up, clipped onto a screw, and this is, if you like, the workhorse over the last 20 years of uh, bone conduction. It's well established, uh, simple surgery. Um, there's a number of power options and the companies driving it are, tend to be hearing aid companies, so it's benefited from hearing aid technology. However, oh, and this is, the, this is showing the sort of power options um, with Cochlear. Cochlear being one of the um, manufacturers of the, the Baja. Um, you can go right up to the superpower one, which is 65 decibels. Oticon are, again, massive, they're a massive hearing aid company, and they've got into the market, and they have a number of bone conducting options as well. Um, the problem is you've got an external screw, which a lot of people don't like the look of, that goes through the skin, and it is certainly prone to getting skin problems and potentially loosening and coming out. So here's a, another lady who's again got bilateral CSOM, uh, discharging ears, and she's actually had a Baja. So just, just tell me the problems that you get, you know, with your ears when you wear a hearing aid, when you try and wear a hearing aid. Um, they just go really hot, yeah. itchy, and skin, X and sort of stuff. Yeah. And then I get an infection discharge. Yeah, and this has been going on a long time, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when you can't, when you're not wearing your hearing aids, how do you, how much do you struggle with your hearing? When I'm not wearing anything, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. So it's a bit of a catch twenty two situation. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the issue about the gain is to do with whether if you're using a bone conduction and the and the bone conduction is normal as opposed to the air conduction, then you, the gain is you don't need to amplify because you're using bone conduction, which goes directly into the cochlea, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know which one you mean by the cochlea is different from the magnetic transcutaneous um, implant, whether you mean the cochlea, the Baja. Maybe we'll come back to that at the end. I'm quite happy to revisit that. So this lady's got a problem. Um, she's got a problem in the sense that she's had a bar heart. It's kind of fallen out. She doesn't want another one. What are the options? Well, that's where the transcutaneous implant comes in, um, using the same principles in terms of vibration in the skull and osseo integrated to some extent. Um, and that's what we were looking at for her. So there are, in terms of transcutaneous, where the skin's intact, You've got two types of devices. You've got the, on the right here, the passive device, which I mentioned earlier, where the vibration is external and you have to pass it through the skin. Whereas if on an active device, the vibration is actually here. It's under the skin in the bone. And it's the processor on the outside sends the signals for that to be driven, if you like. Um, so the implant generates the stimulation, but that's the most effective way of doing bone, condu bone conduction. So the, the, the standard bone conduction implant, certainly in the UK, and the one that I've certainly had the most experience of, of is the bone bridge implant, um, which looks or looked a bit like this, more of later. Um, and fundamentally, you can see bottom right here, it just gets, gets fixed into a well that's drilled into the bone. And which bit of bone you put it in depends on where you can put it. Now, if they haven't had a mastoid, for example, like that first uh, lady that we saw the video of, 
then potentially you can put it into the sinodural angle and into the mastoid. But you can also put it retrosigmoid behind the sigmoid sinus. You can each actually put it in the temporal bone. Um, and some places do that as a routine. So you do need to do a CT and assess the width, the skull, and you can use software to work it all out. What's made um, life a lot easier is that it's, it's, it's become a lot smaller, as you can see here. Um, I think the next slide shows that. So if you, if you look, that's the old one that I just showed the picture of. But the new, um, the new bone bridge is only 4.5 millimetres depth, which makes life a lot easier when you're um, putting it in. So, and it's, so it's a relatively simple surgical technique. There's not a great risk to damaging the inner ear, um, and it works very well. And, and, and with patients who have uh, airborne gap of more than 30 decibels, it's actually more, more effective for the reasons I alluded to and we discussed in terms of gain, it's more effective than a conventional hearing aid, in fact. Although, as I'll mention with commissioning and stuff, you've really got to, with all these patients, really, you've got to start off by trying conventional hearing aids. The problem uh, for those devices comes when you've got a hearing aid, like, a, sorry, an audiogram, a bit like the two on the right here, where you've got a, a much worse sensorineural um, loss. So if, if you look at these on the left, all else, all else being equal, then a bone bridge would be an excellent choice or a percutaneous Baha, depending on circumstances. These days, I must admit, I don't even do Bahas. My colleagues do Bahas. I don't even, I don't do the surgery, but occasionally we'll still list them from the combined clinic for a Baha, and it's usually on the basis of being able to do under local anesthetic or power issues. Because of the two audios on the right there, sorry, um, because of the center and neuro reserve being down sort of 50, 60, then a Baja is not going to be powerful enough. And that's where the percutaneous, the different sorts of Bajas come in. Because if you saw, as you saw earlier, they've got more power options for um, driving, you know, to 60 decibels uh, or more. The other implant, just to mention, is the Carina implant, which, again, was brought in as a option for people who are out of criteria for bone bridge, even out of criteria for Baja, but just out of criteria for cochlear implantation. They, they, they said, you know, the companies were saying that you could drive the acicular chain and it can deal with losses like this. However, so, and it, I've done three um, and it's a complex fiddly carry on doing it and maybe aware Oh, it's not moving on. There we go. It was taken off the market. Um, must be, yeah, a couple of years ago. No, just less, I think. Just before lockdown, possibly. Um, everything's dated these days by lockdown or before or after, but there we are. Um, so, yeah, Karina is not an option at the moment. It did work well for some and not for others, if I'm honest about it. There is something called the, the esteem middle ear implant, which I have no experience of. I'm not entirely certain that anyone in the UK has done it, the principle behind that is it is a fully implantable device like the Carina, and it uses the patient's own um, tympanic membrane as, if you like, the microphone. So it's not gonna be useful for certain types of pathology, frankly. So I can't really comment too much on that because I've never, no experience of it. Okay, so that's um, a slightly different, uh, this is a slightly different scenario. Um, just have a quick look at the chat. Uh, okay. Um, here's a guy with a different, slightly different problem. About your hearing on the right side, you lost it suddenly or suddenly? suddenly. Uh, just woke up one morning. Gone. Go on, go on, and it didn't recover. Didn't recover no. Obviously. Are you okay, so I'm sure some of you all have seen that if you've been ENT. Um, we don't still really know what causes it. Where bang, somebody's hearing's just gone in one ear. It can be associated with tinnitus, can be associated with balance problems, but it does happen from time to time, and it can happen all sorts of ages, um, sadly. And it's a bit of a disaster for that patient. And this is the kind of levels we may be talking about. For those of you who are starting into or even doing the exam, don't fall for somebody giving you an audiogram like this and saying, what does that show? You've got to say, that needs masking, okay? Because otherwise you don't know what the central neural reserve is on the right-hand side. 
But fundamentally, when you mast it, what is that is showing, because there's limits to the bone conduction thresholds, but that's basically showing a, a profound centroneural single-sided deafness in the right ear. Bang. That's what this guy had. So obviously we can have a, there'll be probably other talks on what you do about it in the acute situation or the, the emergency situation, whether you get, well, give steroids and injectable middle ear steroids, all that kind of thing. But once that's all settled down, if there's been no recovery, what are the options? Well, a lot of patients just manage actually, and they don't have anything, even when you, you discuss it with them. Um, sometimes they come to us many years later, in fact. But the first thing, so we we have a certainly in Bradford, I'm sure the departments do a, a set way of dealing with these. We always try them with a cross aid if they if they're struggling. Some patients like it, um, but others just don't get on with it. Basically, what we do then do is we do an assessment where the bone conduction can help, and that assessment it's the same for all these patients who are potentially going to have bone conducting devices you can a soft band is like a headband that vibrate give, gives you bone conducting uh, hearing it's not as good as when the, the as when you actually put the implant in but it is a way of the patient seeing whether they like it so this guy went through that assessment he tried a cross aid didn't like it he tried different sorts of crossover hearing aids before they gave me one of the cross ones and there's yeah. a bendy chronic the, the, with no hearing aid whatsoever so somebody is talking to me over this side i just ignore them and the blank the one and they're yeah. talking to me because the cross ones the cross hearing aid i knew there was somebody there i knew they were saying something yeah but not what it was so i could turn to them and say can you say that again so he's just talking about the sort of problems people have when they um, have a single-sided deafness so the other alternative is to do a bone conducting device. Um, and as I say, we do some assessments which involve speech testing, um, but actually they're never gonna get great localization, if I'm honest, from a bone conducting device because it's the other cochlea that's picking it up. And it's the most important thing with these assessments, slightly different when you're doing it for other reasons, uh, like CSOM and things like that. But for these assessments, it's really what the patient tells you when you do the assessment with the if you like, temporary bone conducting device. Um, so in these situ situations, whether you use a Baja or a bone bridge, what you're actually doing is sending the signal because the cochlea is gone on the right hand side, say, the signal goes across to the other cochlea. And it's somewhat surprising that patients find it beneficial, but he did. Whereas with this, I can, of a lot of the time, if it's if it's not, it's not too much noise in the background, yeah. I can actually understand what they're saying. You have to concentrate, but it's a lot, lot better than it was. Yes, yeah, it's fairly recently you've had that switched on. It's just, it? yeah, about three, four weeks ago, something like that. Okay, so you've noticed a, a, a big improvement in the quality of the sound. Yes, definitely. It's good. It's the, yeah, the, the ability to, to comprehend. That's yeah. the key difference. Good. So he did very well with it, and that was only after a few weeks. So that's single-sided definitely. What's about the, guy. Um, the problems you get when you try and wear a hearing aid, a normal hearing aid? Well, when I wear a hearing aid, it's like two, two days, if a day, you yeah. know, started leaking. Discharged, uncomfortable, yeah. is it? That's yeah. Yeah. And that's been going on for years now, isn't it? It does, yeah. yeah. So basically you struggle to wear hearing aids, conventional hearing aids. Yeah, okay. all we need starts, you know, yeah. got Right, okay. <laughs> so... so <laughs> Um, so yeah, he's kind of got a scenario which again you see a lot of, which instead of having a nice visible um, eardrums, and in fact the eardrums are fine, but he's getting chronic otitis externa, basically. And um, the thing with these guys is that the, the, the hearing tests are vary depending on how blocked they are and how infected they are, but fundamentally the ossicles and the cochleas are basically working fine. Um, and the reason he's struggling is wearing conventional hearing aids causes infection. So is there a way that we can um, utilize the, the, the ossicles on one side or even both sides? So that's where something like the, the vibrant sound bridge, as it's called, comes, the technology comes in. Because basically, that's a middle ear implant with this 
they call it a floating mass transducer which vibrates and um, as I'll show you clip it onto the ossicles and it then gives it instead of unlike the bone conducting devices which go across to both cochlears or one cochlear if it's a single-sided deafness in these cases that's just stimulating the one ear it's it's a single-sided stimulation if you like in fact the guy who invented this um, is an American guy who now lives in Innsbruck because he went to work for Medell and developed it with Medell when he, after he developed the prototype, if you like. He's actually got bilateral VSBs in um, and he invented it because of his hearing loss. So there's different ways of putting these, this floating mass transducer, as it's called, onto the acicular chain. So you can put it on the Incas, you can put it on the long, that's the traditional way actually, on the, the long process of the Incus, or you can put it on the body of the Incus, you can put it on the long process of the Incus, you can even put it in the round window, as that illustrates. And this is the kind of uh, thresholds of which you get benefit. And it can be used for sensory neural loss. Um, and in fact, that's what um, the guy that invented it had, is he had a sensory neural on the conductive loss, which um, was mild to moderate, but as he put it, he said, why, why is this called mild to moderate hearing loss? Because it's, you know, he couldn't do his work. He was struggling with it big time. So um, the benefits of this is that it, it stimulates the inner ear directly and therefore it, it doesn't go in the ear canal. Um, it, it's, it seems to have stable benefit. It doesn't degrade and it works extremely well. One of the problems with it is the fact that the surgery is certainly more complex. Um, as I say, tradition, and you do, so you do everything. Bear in mind, these patients have got a normal eardrum. You don't want to disrupt that. Normally a canal, you don't want to disrupt that. And therefore you come in through the, a bit like an implant, actually, a cochlear implant, where you do a cortical mastoid, extended atacotomy. You have to actually extend the atacotomy a lot more than with implant surgery. Certainly if you're going to put it onto, they call it short process, but actually what you do is you put it onto the body of the incus, which is this bit. Or you put it through a posterior tympanotomy, which is obviously call the posterior tympanotic because you're coming from behind into the tympanum and the mesotympanum. And you actually have to do a bigger posterior tympanotomy than you do for a cochlear implant. So it, it's, not, it's not surgery that's that easy, if I'm honest about it, um, but it works extremely well. So these are the options. You can put it on the short pro with the body and incus, the long process or even down in the round window. Um, are they commissioned? Uh, yes. The issue, I'm putting this slide up just to say that I think there's a massive postcode lottery when it comes to middle ear implants and bone conducting devices. That's the impression I get. Um, so there are centers, I mean, Bajas, there's quite a lot of centers doing Bajas, but maybe less so doing these middle ear implants. But the, the current situation, they should, they should be linked into a implant center because not necessarily done by the implant center, but there should be like an MDT discussion around what's the best for this patient because uh, that provides that, that discusses all options and that includes cochlear implants so that's really where we're heading we've not got there with this but as long as you've tried conventional hearing aids um other things like crossover aids then they are commissioned but it's at the moment for certain centers but it's a, it is it strikes me as a hit and miss thing there you go so there's criteria you've got to fulfill and it's best done through an MDT, which is why, uh, you know, all these patients that I'm showing you videos of are all in a joint MDT. And any, any of you coming up to consultant job, you get inter are you're interested in otology or whatever, set one up. You know, in Bradford, we're lucky to have an extremely good audiology department. They're fantastic. And uh, I, I really enjoy working with them, actually. So we go through all the results and we make a decision, which is an MDT decision. We also do all these assessments, speech assessments, and even crescent of sound, not, you know, not in all patients, but a lot of them get what's called a crescent of sound um, assessment, which is about localization of sound. So you might enjoy, this is a cochlear implant a, a, a lady who's had a bilateral cochlear implant when we were doing a study on that. And the interesting thing is she's, the reason she got bilateral cochlear implant is because she's deaf in both ears and she's blind. Uh, because of Refsum's disease. So when I say blind, she's got very little vision at all. So she's got a dog, a visual dog as well. 
but she did it. She had a great result. And she, this is her doing the uh, crescent of sound with bilateral implants in. And what you've got to watch is the dog as well as her. So she's got having to localize where the sound's coming from. So clearly the, do the dog had bilateral hearing as well, which is reassuring. Um, so this is that guy again, who's he's had the, um, a soft band trial. That's a bit of an old picture of a soft band. They are a bit softer than that now, but... Um, he trial the, the other this is device, the, um, the bone band over there, just to see what the sound like. How did you find that compared to... Well, when he had so, it on, I 10 times better. Could you? Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously, it, you know, that was a band. And um, what we may be looking to do is do something a bit more permanent. So that's, is that something that interests you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Can you trial the other? So, and, and in fact, for him, where he's got bilateral otitis externa intact in panic membranes, we were thinking about a VSB. So the bone cut, if he gets benefit from the bone cut, he's probably going to get even more benefit from the VSB. So a final comment is sort of about paediatrics as well. Um, and this is a scenario, thankfully, not that common, <clears throat> often unilateral, but a atresia of the pinna uh, and microtia. Um, and there's no ear canal. So you've got a problem there. Um, sometimes the acicular chain can be working all right, the cochlear can be working all right, but you can't wear an ear aid. Um, how are you going to manage that? Um, sorry. Through. And that's the kind of hearing loss we're talking about. A con sort of maximum conductive hearing loss. But the cochlears are often working in these cases, and can we use them? So one option, especially as these obviously get diagnosed at birth or neonatal period, what can we do? Well, this is a device that's well worth knowing about for audiology departments. And again, I think it's a postcode lottery of who has access to this. This is called an ADEA. And it's, it is a bone conduct device that sticks on the back of the ear. Um, and it, it works very well. And obviously it doesn't involve any surgery. And certainly for the younger periods before you can consider operating on these patients when the kids are young, especially if it's bilateral, but uh, unilateral as well we've got two ears for a reason they're going to benefit from something like this that they they it sticks on you have to change this every few days that's the thing but it's it's well worth using and for microtia at a young age and it's usable usable for other things so glue ear for example in pediatrics we've certainly in bradford used it for certain cases of sort of severe conductive loss for kids that for whatever reason we're not going down the grommet road um so there are a couple of options there for pediatrics and in adults as well i have an anesthetic colleague who's got bilateral mastoids complex otological history going back many years um who wears one um and finds it much better than her conventional aid so for a unilateral conductive loss, um, you've got a situation where a bone, where you can put in a bone conducting device like this or an idea or whatever, or a, or a bone bridge even. The thing to remember about a unilateral conductive loss, so this is the conductive loss where there's a problem, is that, okay, you can drive the cochlea by putting a bone conducting device on the side of the pathology. Let's say that's microtia or glue or it doesn't really matter what. The problem is, because of inter or attenuation of bone conduction, it will cross over to the other side. So you've got the slightly complicating factor that the sound will go over to the side and potentially confuse things in terms of working out where sound's coming from. Whereas the vibrant sound bridge, which I mentioned, gets round that because it, it clipping onto the ossicles on the side that you put it on. So these are the different couplers that we use. It's certainly worth considering in those situations where the cochlea is working. So if the cochlea is working and there is a middle ear, then think about a VSB. You've got to do a scan. You've got to find out what's going on deep to a microtia like this on the, this side, right side, sorry, this side. Um, 
it's very important. Now, if there's a middle ear space, there's often a secular chain abnormality. So my experience of these microtias, it's not a huge experience, done some, um, is that the acicular chain is abnormal and you often have to, to dis, you have to uh, dislocate the long process of the incus or the lenticular process of the incus from the stapes and actually put the coupler directly onto the stapes because uh, usually the stapes is working well. But the beauty of this is it gives, it gives sound directly to the cochlea and it doesn't cross over to the other side. So that's basically it. Um, as I mentioned, you all know about hearing aids, you all know about cochlear implants, but this is all about those other patients. And, it, and I think it's one of those things you've got to think about for patients. You'll see them. If you look for these patients in clinic, and sometimes they end up in chronic ear clinics and things like that, um, and audiology obviously see them and they struggle along. Think about you know referring for a multidisciplinary assessment and you know and then get reviewed in a combined MDT because it, it for certain the certain group of these nine million people who have got hearing loss in the UK for a certain percentage of those they would benefit from one of these middle ear implants. So I'm just looking at Ellen's Ellen's comment about the VSB. Um, it is it is a risk of putting it on the long process which is why if you can, these days, we put it on the, um, the, the body uh, of the Incus rather than the long process. It's a bit easier as well, frankly. Um, so it is, it is an issue.